whether you only use 12 volts for lighting and keeping your phone charged, or if you have a compressor fridge or in an inverter. Solar power is a great way to keep you up and running when you're off grid. If the difference between monocrystalline, polycrystalline, PWM and MPPT sets your head spinning, keep watching and I'll help you make the right choice of solar for your van. As we're approaching some key milestones in our subscriber count, we wanted to say thank you. So watch out for some fantastic prize giveaways for our subscribers, including a dash cam, a MiFi, an internet dongle, an induction hob, a 12 volt TV, solar panels and more, all coming soon. Let's start with a basic overview of a solar setup. First you have your panel. This collects solar energy and converts it to electrical energy. Then you have your solar controller, which the electrical energy from the panel is fed to. The controller's main job is to control how the electrical energy provided by the panel is used to charge your battery efficiently. Your battery is obviously a store of electrical energy to use for your load. Some controllers have a load output. This allows it to control and monitor how much energy you're using with your appliances. This, however, is often limited its capability to low current devices, so you may have to connect high current devices, like an inverter, direct to the battery. Some controllers also have an interface or built-in capability for Bluetooth, Wi-Fi and remote displays, and I'll talk more about these later. And obviously, the final thing you need is some sun. So that's a simple representation. It's not quite as simple as that when it comes to connecting up as you need to have both positive and negative connections. And as always, you should fit suitably protective fuses or circuit breakers. Finally, a cable gland will safely get cables from outside to inside the van and some mounting hardware for the panel will keep it safely attached. When selecting a panel, first let's look at the types available. There are rigid or flexible. For me, unless you really need it for reasons of weight or installation, I personally would avoid flexible. These tend to degrade quicker, be more expensive per watt, and due to often being installed with no or very little air gap, which I'll talk more about later, they can be less efficient. The two main types of panel manufacture are monocrystalline and polycrystalline. Poly is less efficient, so the size of panel for the same power is physically larger than mono. You can see in this example the dimensions for a polycrystalline panel and a monocrystalline panel. They'll generate the same amount of power in the same conditions, but the poly will take up a bit more smooth space and is around half the price. So if space is not a limiting factor, you could save some money by choosing a poly panel. If you have limited space or want the most energy with the smallest panel, go for monocrystalline. So how many watts do you need? Everybody's requirements for solar is different. How long do you expect to be off grid? What appliances are you expected to use? And how often? Plus where in the world will you be using it? And in what season? Here is a general example of how I consider what size panel I need. First, you need to understand your 12 volt power demand by listing all your 12 volt appliances. Their power rating, which will be on the device or with the tech spec, for how many hours you would be using it on an average day and then multiply the watts by the hours to give you a daily watt hours. Add all of these together and you get your total daily demand. This is how much power you will take from your batteries in an average day. In this example I've deliberately included some high usage items in this list. For example a microwave through an inverter for 15 minutes and a water pump running for 15 minutes to cover taking a shower and general water use. Obviously it's possible to cut this down quite drastically when you're off grid to limit your power usage. So consider this when you calculate your demand. Also be careful when calculating things like compressor fridges. Remember that although you use them 24 hours a day, they aren't actually running at full usage for that period as the compressor switches itself on and off as required. So in this example, I've used a duty cycle of 50%, so equivalent to the compressor running for 12 hours within each 24 hour period. This will vary by fridge and usage. For example, how often you open the door and what setting you have it on. You can see in this example that on the average day, the total usage is 1,336 watt-hours. 
So for this example, I'm going to look at the UK. We all know how unpredictable our weather is. So for the purpose of this calculation, we're going to use the average numbers of sun hours per day as calculated by the UK Met Office. To calculate the theoretical panel you'd need to replenish your daily usage, we take the daily power demand divided by the sun hours and divided by the panel efficiency. Panel efficiency is impacted by loads of factors temperature, how clean it's kept, how optimal it's positioned and angled, and even with fully optimised clean and cool panels, efficiency is generally around 85%. So on a van where positioning and angle are a challenge, I've assumed for the purposes of this example 60% efficiency, but it could be even less. So taking all this information into account, we can see that if we wanted to replenish all the power we may use on an average December day, we would theoretically need panels of at least 1,113 watts. On an average day in May, a panel of at least 371 watts would be enough. So depending on when you want to use your van off-grid, could help you make a decision on what panels you need. Remember this is all individual to your usage, location and it's all theoretical. If you want to avoid the need for all this, you may just choose the biggest panel you can fit and afford. I've never heard anybody complain that they have too much power, but lots complain that they don't have enough. When it comes to installation of your panel, you can buy different types of mounting. Some which theoretically can be stuck down with a suitable adhesive if you have a suitable surface. Others need to be bolted or many people, including myself, mount the panel on roof bars. When installing panels, having an air gap behind them is a real advantage because the efficiency of a panel decreases as the temperature increases. Keeping it as cool as possible will help it to generate more energy. Roof racks tend to give the biggest amount of air cap and therefore keep the panel coolest. Another consideration you may make is to design a frame that allows you to tilt the panel. Assuming you can tilt it in the right direction, this can maximise the efficiency by capturing more intense solar, particularly in winter, away from the equator. As we saw earlier, the main job of the controller is managing how the energy provided from the panel is applied to charging the battery effectively. Pulse Width Modulation, or PWM, and Maximum Power Point Tracking, or MPPT controllers, both do this, but use different methods to optimise the charging of the battery. PWM is simpler, but less efficient. When using PWM, you don't benefit from all the energy that you could harvest. However, they cost substantially less than MPPT, which could give you spare money you could use on more or bigger panels. MPPT controllers are more expensive, but are capable of converting the excess voltage provided by the panel into usable current to charge your batteries. PWM can't do this and effectively wastes that energy. With an MPPT controller, you can also use higher voltage panels, such as domestic grid connect panels. As the voltage is higher, there's less power loss in the cables. Grid connect panels are also often available at very good prices per watt compared to the lower voltage panels. Once you've decided which type of controller is best for you, you need to take into account your panel ratings to determine the rating of the controller you need. For controllers that have a load connection, also take note of the maximum load in amps you can take though you can always connect direct to the battery for higher loads. Some controllers also have interfaces to connect to remote monitor screen, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, either with modules or built-in. This can be very useful if you want to hide your main controller away but still monitor its performance. If you're unsure how your chosen panel will perform, you may choose to oversize your controller. This gives you the capacity to add more panels in the future if you find the panel you've chosen is not giving you enough power. If you do decide to go with an MPPT controller, do make sure you're actually getting one. There are lots of fakes around, particularly on auction and purchasing websites. You can usually spot them by checking a few things. The maximum PV voltage, if less than 90 volts, they're unlikely to be MPT. The price, expect to pay at least £50 and often more for a true MPPT. And finally, the physical size of the unit. True MPTs are heavier and larger. 
As you can see here, these controllers that claim to be MPPT look very similar to the PWN controller we saw earlier. If you're looking to spend the extra money on an MPPT controller, be absolutely sure you get what you want. I would recommend buying from a reputable manufacturer such as EPVA or Victron and from a proven supplier such as Photonic Universe or Bimble Solar. If you find you need extra cables to connect your panel, you can buy pre-made up cables. Just check the spec matches your panel and for safety be very careful to cover your panel or isolate it with a breaker before connecting the panels up as they can arc. Getting your cables safely inside the van without them getting damaged or water getting into your van, I recommend using a cable entry gland. And for your load cabling, sizing is really important. There's lots of calculators online to make sure you use the right gauge. But remember, these often give the cross-sectional area of the conductor in square millimetres, not the physical diameter of the cable in millimetres. So make sure you don't confuse the two. It's vital that you protect your setup with appropriate fuses or circuit breakers. These need to be sized to the panels or load you're protecting. My personal preference is circuit breakers as they're easy to use to isolate the supply and easy to reset rather than having to carry around spare fuses. Do make sure that any circuit breakers are rated for the correct DC current as AC breakers may not be suitable as they can continue to arc when switched off under DC current. As there are so many variations and options depending on your needs, it's very hard to give any real recommendations. But here are some memory joggers to help. If you want the most power for the space you have, for example you have high demand for power or limited space for panels, go with a genuine MPPT controller and the biggest monocrystalline panel or panels you can fit. For the best value for money, I'd suggest polycrystalline panels could save some cost if you have the space for slightly larger panels. Or if you're on a budget, a PWM controller with polycrystalline panels will be the cheapest and still functional, but not quite as effective. Hope that information helps you to pick the right solar setup for your van. If you found the video useful, please like, share and consider subscribing. Is this the best 12 volt TV for your camper van? Hit subscribe now so you don't miss our review.